Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Thank you for joining with us via video uh, today for our worship service. I'm so thankful for our church and uh, your faithfulness in uh, as you continue to worship and fellowship one with another, even though we are uh, separated and unable to meet inside the building. Uh, we are looking to get back into the sanctuary for worship on August 16th. That's what we're shooting for right now. And we are prayer, prayerfully considering that as uh, we get new information. Uh, but I, I, I hope that you're praying for our leadership as we make those decisions. And uh, hopefully August 16th, we'll be back in here and we can stay in here uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, I thank you that you have been faithful in your giving. We have people who've been sending their uh, tithes and offerings in through the mail to 3000 Sun Valley Drive, uh, Mobile, Alabama, 36618. Uh, many people have been doing that. Uh, many people have been uh, tithing, giving to missions through the app uh, that is available on your phone or on our website. And we have several people who've actually driven up here and put their offering in through the gym door. What a blessing it is to be part of Crawford Baptist Church as we continue to love God, serve God, and minister to others even during this difficult time. This morning I'm going to read uh, from a very familiar passage of Scripture that I'll, that I'll refer to some during the message. Uh, and I hope that it is a blessing to you as you think about it. It's very familiar, so don't get caught up in just knowing what it says. Think about these words. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful, as I said, for our church and what it means, even though we are kept apart, we uh, are one in the bond of love. We are part of the body of Christ. And so there is unity and harmony, even though we are distant from each other. And I thank you that you uh, that are, are uh, I thank you that our church is around during this time and active and involved uh, we are praying for those people who have been uh, who have gone into the hospital and had other types of emergencies. We've been supporting those people who have been blessed as we most recently have been thankful for uh, the barriers and the birth of their new baby girl. It is a blessing to be part of the family of God. And I thank you 
that it's possible because you are the God of unity. You are the God of harmony. You are the God that brings us together even in our times of trial. And I praise you for who you are. There are many who are dealing with the problems of this world and the problems of our country in a very different way. They're angry, they're frustrated, they're hurting, they're lost. And I pray, Lord, that you could possibly draw them to yourself during this time. May we be the instruments of that message. There are many all over the world who have no clue that you are the God of comfort. You are the good shepherd who knows our name. I want to lift up the Hajam people in Pakistan. Over two million lost souls with no Christian influence. How desperate these days must be without a God of hope and peace and even joy in trial. We call upon you as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Behold you, my Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Today we are going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. And uh, the first five verses that we're going to look at have the word comfort ten times. So we are going to see, uh, we're going to study about the God of comfort. And in those verses we find out that he is the God of all comfort and abundant comfort. So the first thing I want us to do is to think about what comfort is. And then we'll talk about how comfort is given. And then I will have some action steps that answer the question, what do we do with that comfort? So first of all, what is comfort? If I were to ask you to draw a picture up in your mind of what comfort looks like, some of you might picture your tan feet at the end of a lounge chair with the beach and the ocean and the clear blue skies in the background. Some of you may uh, draw up another type of picture, but that's not really the picture of comfort. That's more of a picture of luxury. So I'm going to paint a different picture uh, to help us understand what comfort is as I see it in these verses. So let's picture a family in the home. The dad is sitting on the end of the sofa, feet up on the coffee table, uh, lay, uh, leaning back, just enjoying the afternoon. His family went to worship that morning, sat together and enjoyed each other's uh, company as they worshiped with their church. And then they had lunch and now they are just enjoying the afternoon. His yard work uh, was completed yesterday. His job is going fairly well, and he loves his wife. And where is his wife? His wife is nestled in the sofa next to him with her head up under his arm. She loves her husband and is thankful for who he is, his hard work, uh, the fact that he has helped raise their kids and uh, run the home. Uh, the wife is thinking about the housework that all got done yesterday. Uh, Dad and the kids all helped. And uh, she loves her aging husband. Even though his stomach has gotten a little bit larger, she has her hand rested on his stomach and just pats it every once in a while because of her love for him. And one of the things that is overwhelming to her is that right now, all the kids are getting along. Where are they? They're sitting at the kitchen table and they're playing a game. The college student uh, just recently finished a paper that took a lot of work and time and, uh, and is planning a kayaking trip with their friends uh, the next day. The high schooler, not too long ago, got their driver's license and is thinking about starting a job and is excited about that. Uh, later that evening, the teenager is going to the cartoon movie with their friends, a decent movie. The elementary school child not too long ago accepted Christ and is learning a new instrument and later that night is going to a birthday party. The middle schooler made the team that they tried out for and later on that evening has their best friend coming over to the house just to hang out. Grandpa, he is uh, laying back in the, in the recliner he has a book on his chest, but he's basically sleeping. Uh, every once in a while, he pokes his head up, looks around, and realizes that everything's still okay, and goes back to sleep. Grandma is in the kitchen, and she's working. 
But to her, it's not work. To her, it's a hobby. It is enjoyable. And she loves the idea of creating a meal and sharing it with her loved one. So every once in a while, she peeks out of the kitchen, lets the aroma of the, of the kitchen fill the room, but she pokes her head out of the door to just admire the family that she's connected with. Her child met a spouse that has been a good spouse and has helped raise good grandchildren for her. So I look at that picture and you say, okay, that is a picture of comfort. But that's really not the picture that I want us to see. Because when we read these verses that I'm about to read, we find out that comfort is not that type of picture, but that comfort is connected with affliction and suffering. So I'm going to read the verses out of 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 through 11. And I want you to listen to where comfort is connected with suffering or affliction. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which, uh, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope is for you. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Why? We felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from so deadly a peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us in prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us in answer to many prayers. So as you read those verses, you Almost here, as much as you, uh, the word comfort, you hear the word suffering or affliction. So in that picture I drew of the family, I'm going to help us understand comfort a little bit more by throwing a wrench in the system. And some wrenches are small. Typically that's what we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, but every once in a while... Affliction comes as a huge wrench in the system. So let me adjust our story a bit. Let's look at dad. Oh wait, he's not there. The reason he's not there is because he lost his job. And right now he's working on a temporary assignment and because of that, he has to work on Sundays occasionally. And because he has lost his job, the wife is worried about the finances. And the children are upset because their friends are uh, getting things that they are not able to get. And it, uh, the financial burden is tough. Or if I want it to draw even a harsher picture, I could say that the dad's not there because of divorce. Let's think about the grandparents. 
Let's imagine that one of the grandparents is seriously hurting physically or mentally. That changes the dynamic of that family picture immensely. Let's think about the middle schooler. Imagine that the middle schooler is failing in school, has given up, is addicted to social media or video games, and has actually co contemplated suicide. Do we see the desperate nature of what is going on when we imagine such a terrible situation? The college student may be uh, sad and desperate for a relationship and is moved away from a biblical world view. Let's imagine that the child in our picture, we, it's just been found out that that child is being bullied by an older child. Or even worse, by an adult. Imagine that the mom in that story being depressed due to self-esteem self issues. And you're thinking, okay, that's a, that's a teenager problem. Not necessarily. There are mothers who look in the mirror see that they are getting older, maybe getting wider. And they see uh, other mothers on social media doing so well and she is depressed. And when you think about depression, it's not one of those things where you just say, okay, just stop doing it. Just stop being depressed. And it doesn't work that way. Imagine that the high schooler is involved in rebellious behavior and is becoming addicted to alcohol and drugs and has recently been suspended from school. Their present looks bleak and their future is in grave jeopardy. Imagine the parents in that situation. Every time they hear a siren they wonder, is my child hurting? Is my child in trouble? What have they done? Those parents also, whenever they get a phone call from their child or from a number they don't recognize, they want, their, their heart sinks into their stomach. Oh no, what has happened now? The parents in that situation also may get up in the middle of the night. They have to use the restroom, get a drink of water, and they decide, okay, I need to go check on my teenager. And as they walk toward the bedroom door, they're praying to themselves, please be in the bed. I drew some pictures of some very huge problems that families face. Usually, it might just be one or maybe two of those problems. But as we see in the life of Job, sometimes when it rains, it pours. A lot of times, problems create other problems. So it is in that story, it is in that picture where we can really understand what comfort is. Because in those times of desperation, we need a God of mercy and of comfort. When you look at the verse that we read where Paul uh, says in verse 8, Listen to this phrase. For we were so utterly, unbearably,
crushed that we despaired of life itself. Do you hear the desperation in that in those words? And that is coming from someone who is praising the comfort of God. So we see that comfort is connected with suffering and affliction. One of the things we need to understand as well is that God's comfort does not necessarily mean that he's going to remove a problem from from our lives, but he does say that he his comfort will overshadow it. God comforts us in our affliction not necessarily from our afflictions. When we look at the Psalm 23, the sheep are taken to green pastures and still waters, but the sheep are also taken through the valley of the shadow of death. And that is where we see true comfort because it is there where we fear no evil. Because of the God of comfort. So let me look real quickly at the importance of this idea that God gives all comfort. So as our afflictions, our suffering, our challenges, our problems, as they grow, as they get big, depending on how huge those problems are, we know that God gives all comfort which means that God, God's comfort covers all of that. No matter how big our problems get, we can call on God's comfort. So let me talk real quickly about the method in which we receive comfort. We talked about what comfort is and how it uh is connected with affliction. Now let's talk real quickly about how we get comfort. And I'm going to say that we get comfort through the presence, through words, and through action. And what I mean by that is this. Comfort comes in peaceful words in personal attention and powerful action. I'm going to use another picture to help us understand what I mean by that. Imagine that you have been in a car accident. You're dazed, confused. You don't know what has happened. You smell the smoke. You feel the glass. You see that there is blood. You don't know where it's coming from. You are confused. The airbag has been deployed and you are in a lot of trouble. That's all you know. You know you hurt, but you really don't know where because you're in shock. It is in that type of situation when we are in a desperate situation that we need comfort. And so the first person who comes on the scene is a passerby. Someone who is just nearby comes and is able to get the door open, starts talking to you, starts ministering to you. So their presence brings comfort. I'm not alone. Someone is here with me. And then their words bring comfort. Are you okay? I've called 911. It'll be okay. I'm here for you. And then you, you see their actions. This might be a, a guy who takes off his shirt and applies it to your head. And so, and, and so in that moment, you realize, okay, evidently I'm bleeding from my head. I don't know how bad it is. But their actions of taking care of you in their uh, as, an, as an amateur, as a novice, their efforts bring comfort. But what happens is when the EMT arrives, that comfort is even greater. 
Because the presence of the EMT says, okay, here's someone who knows what they're doing. Here's someone who can help me get out of this situation. So the EMT arrives and just their presence means a lot. And then they start talking. And a lot of their uh, words are not to you, but to others. And, and they're talking about, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get them out of the car. We're going to get them on the stretcher. We're going to get them in the ambulance. We're going to check their vitals. We're, and so all those words bring comfort because it also represents the actions in which they are participating in. They're doing something to better your situation. So as the passerby brings comfort, the EMT brings even more comfort. And then when you get to the hospital, the doctor who has more equipment and is able to more uh, specifically look at your situation can give you more information. So the presence of the doctor, the words of the doctor, and the actions of the doctor bring even more comfort. So you see that God's all comfort is not just based on our suffering, but it's also based on His abundance of mercy and power. So as you are sitting there or as you're lying there in the hospital and you've, you're comforted because people are taking care of you, what happens where do you get the comfort when you are told that you are now paralyzed from the waist down? You hear that the person in the other vehicle, that there was a child in the other vehicle and the child died. And the accident was your fault. Do you see how desperate, how deep that affliction and suffering is? Where do you go for comfort? You don't go to the passerby. You don't go to the EMT. You don't go to the doctor. You go to the God of all comfort. That is how God gives us His comfort. He gives it to us with His presence. Even though I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you are with me. God's presence, God's words, God, God has filled his word with uh, instruction and encouragement, things that we can rely on that can bring us comfort when we are struggling. So his presence his words, and then his actions. God says that if a sparrow falls, he knows about it and he cares about that sparrow. And how much more do we, how much more are we valued by God? There are some attributes of God that even amplify this even more. How does God comfort us in such a dire situation? He does it because He is all-powerful. He can do it because He is all-knowing. Those problems that you have that are very deep and very dark that nobody even knows about, God does. God knows and God is eternal. So he knows what your future is. And he knows what your past is and he knows where you are in your story. And so God can bring comfort because he knows you and knows your story. God has been demonstrated to be a servant. He cares about us. We see that in the life of Jesus as he uh, ministered to those who were hurting and he washed the feet of the disciples. God wants the best for us. He has empathy for us in our struggles. God 
comforts us with his all-encompassing presence. There's nowhere we can go to get away from God. His love engulfs us. It's deep, it's high, it's wide. God's love surrounds us. He comforts us with his all-encompassing presence. He comforts us with his almighty word. And he comforts us with his all-powerful work. That is the God of all comfort. As I mentioned earlier, in those verses, we also hear the word abundant comfort. So what does that mean? And I've talked about how God's character and God's work brings us comfort. But imagine this. It's not just all comfort. It is abundant comfort. So we see that in uh, Philippians 4, 7. He provides peace that passes understanding. We can't even understand where this peace comes from that's in my life, in my heart, because my, the storm is raging around me. But I have peace. And it passes understanding. In Romans 15, 13, we are reminded that we have access to overflowing hope. In Ephesians 2, 4, we see that God is rich in mercy. In James 1, 2, we see that we can have joy even in trials. God is the God of forgiveness, redemption, reconciliation. He can make us blameless and remove us of our sins and our uh, the, the, the times that we have rebelled and made mistakes. God is the God of abundant comfort. And that's the nature of it. But the blessing of abundant comfort is this. Because God overflows our comfort, we can minister to others and we can receive ministry from others. And we see that in those verses that I mentioned. If we read that, those verses together, we not only see how comfort is connected with affliction, but we also see where comfort and affliction is connected with the family of God and with the ministry of God. So let me read those verses again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We share abundantly in God's sufferings so through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. And then move down to verse 11. You also must help us in prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us in answer to many prayers. So the blessing of abundant comfort is this. We are connected to other people through ministry. So now that I have helped us understand what comfort is and that it's connected with affliction and we see where God gives us comfort that is all comfort and abundant comfort. I want to end with these action steps. Action step number one, we should embrace the unifying nature of suffering and comfort. We should embrace the unifying nature of suffering and comfort. 
Our suffering connects us with God, connects us with each other, and connects us with the lost. Our suffering connects us with God in this way. As it says in, these, in, these, in this verse, we share in Christ's suffering. So when we see that Christ suffered, we are, he demonstrates that he has empathy for us. He's God. He understands us. But when we see that Christ suffered, we know that he knows what we are going through. God's commands for us during suffering were demonstrated by Christ. We talked recently with the teenagers of how Christ was on the cross. He had been beaten. He had been assaulted, spat on, mocked, hung up on a cross in uh, agony and humiliation. And what does he say? Father, forgive them. God asks us to forgive our enemy. How can he ask us to do that if he hasn't done that himself? And so we see that when we share in Christ's sufferings, that helps us. And then we also share in his comfort. And I've already mentioned that he is the God that, of peace that passes understanding, hope that overflows, joy and trials and everlasting life. So we share in God's suffering. In Christ's sufferings, we share in his comfort. Our suffering connects us with each other. As we see in these verses where it says our affliction is for your comfort and our comfort is for your comfort. So what is going on in my life is beneficial to you. Our suffering also connects us to the lost. We see that as we say that suffering and our comfort gives us a gospel message for the lost that is filled with understanding and empathy. Let me say that again. Our suffering, our testimony of suffering and comfort gives us a gospel message that we can share with the lost that is filled with understanding and empathy. We can tell the lost person, I've been there. I know what you're going through. And if I don't know specifically what you're going through, I can probably easily find someone else who has. Because that is the family of God. And we can do ministry to the lost because of our experiences of suffering and comfort. So that's action step number one. We should embrace the unifying nature of suffering and comfort. Action step number two is this. We should regularly express blessings to the God of all comfort. So where do I get that? In the first word of verse three, where we started, is the word blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. We need to lift God up in worship and admiration for who He is and what He's done. And here's how we do it. Three things here. We need to elevate Him personally. Elevate Him in our lives personally. I need to think of him more. I need to understand his presence more. I do that with an attitude of praise and adoration and thanksgiving for the comfort that he's given me. I can do that when I uh, exchange my frustration for prayers. In those times that I'm frustrated, whether it's pet peeves or uh, extreme aggravation at what's going on in the world or in our family or at our job, wherever. I need to replace my frustration with prayer. I need to do daily devotions. I need to worship and I need to sing. Those are some things that we can do to elevate him personally in our lives. The second thing I mentioned there was we need to exalt him publicly. We need to elevate him personally and we need to exalt him publicly. 
We need to boldly praise Him to other people and in the, pre and in the presence of other people. We need to testify of God's story of affliction and comfort in our lives. We need to testify to that. Let me give you some helpful hints for that. One, we can prepare our story. We need to think about if I'm ever given the opportunity to share the gospel or to share my story or to share how I came to Christ or to share how I'm going through affliction right now or how God has comforted me in the past, I need to prepare my story so that I can share it. I also need to be mindful of how I do social media. There's a lot to complain about. There's a lot to be fearful about. But are you posting your, uh, doing your posts in social media that is peppered with, seasoned with the thoughts that God is the God of overflowing hope and the peace that passes understanding? Are you sharing with other people that times are bad, but I am trusting God? Another thing we need to do is uh, do prayer texts. That's another thing we can do. Just text people and tell them that we're praying for them. We need to share our devotions. When we have personal devotions, we need to share that message with others uh, throughout the day. And then the third thing here, we need to elevate Him personally, exalt Him publicly, and we need to emulate Him powerfully. We do that by demonstrating the caring love of God as in the story of the Good Samaritan. We need to look for opportunities to share God's care for those who are hurting. And then as we do that, we can then share with them the gospel. That the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people and sent His Son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear His wrath against sin on the cross and to show His power over sin in the resurrection. So that anyone, anyone who puts their trust in God and repents of their sin can be reconciled to the Father forever. That message has weight when we have done ministry in someone's life. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are the God of all comfort and overflowing comfort. May we understand that deeply in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that we will demonstrate it in the way we talk and the way we live our lives. We thank You. We praise Your name. You are the God of peace and hope and joy, restoration, reconciliation, forgiveness. We praise You for who You are. May our lives be a blessing to you and to others that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.